coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. Once a guard takes the fly, it is not a strip set. If it is a, if it's anything but an alligator guard, it's not a strip set. They'll take the fly, and you need to let them take the fly. Like they're going to move with it, and you need to count to five or six, maybe seven, right? So one Mississippi, all the way up to five. In that five count, you need to pull all of that slack up that's at your feet or in your stripping basket, and that needs to get up on your reel. And the quickest way to do that is to slap the top of your reel. That was John Morris with a little gar tip to start your day. Air-breathing fish, fair flies, brushes, and sewer salmon. Today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how you doing today? Thanks for stopping by the show. We are launching a pretty massive giveaway here uh, that is going on. You can check it out right now, wetflyswing.com slash giveaway. This is the trip. Uh, if you're interested in steelhead fishing and want to dig into this steelhead, we got Jeff Liskay on. This is the steelhead school. Um, check it out right now and find out more. Today's episode is sponsored by Stonefly Nets, putting quality before quantity with their handcrafted custom wood landing nets. When Ethan designs your net, it's his hope and goal to help you form lasting memories every time you're on the water. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly right now. That's S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y to get started right now. We're also sponsored by Fishhound Expeditions, putting together remote Alaskan wilderness trips for that trip of a lifetime. We're going to be heading up there really soon and going to be mousing for rainbows, chasing some salmon, doing it all while on the river kicking back. So I'm going to be excited to share this one with you. If you want to check out Fishhound right now, wetflyswing.com slash fishhound. Connect with Adam and the great trips he has going on in Alaska. John Morris from Working Class Fly Fishing Podcast breaks down gar fishing, tying with brushes, and fly fur. John connects us with the gar guru, we find out what gear you need and the best fly line to use and how rope is used to hook the fish. Plus, gar. Been a long time coming. So without further ado, here we go. John Morris. How's it going, John? Hey. Hey, Dave. It's going well. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming on here today. You, uh, We're going to dig into some on uh, some gar, some fly tying. And, and I love that we're digging into gar because a good friend of mine back in the day, this is probably 20 years ago, Greg, uh, I remember he was always, he was over in Oklahoma and he kept talking about gar. He's like, man, gar, this is the stuff. And it's all this time I still haven't fished for gar, but I'm hoping you can shed some light on, on fishing for gar and then get me fired up to maybe some people to head out your way. Um, so we're going to get into all that, but before we do, bring us back to fly fishing. How'd you first get into it quickly? And then we'll take it into the, uh, the gar and fly tying. Well, man, uh, I fished my whole life. Um, uh, I'm 30, right? I'm, I'm mm-hmm. pretty young fished my whole life. Uh, I'm an army vet. I joined the army long story short. I kind of got pushed away from fishing because of the army, just for time constraints. Uh, I came back from my first tour, my first combat tour, which was Iraq um kind of off balance i couldn't figure out what it was so i picked up fishing again uh fast forward i did two combat tours in afghanistan after that and then i was done i came home i said you know i'm done with all this and it was like they just stocked this little pond and i I live in texas they just stocked uh, stocked this little pond here and uh with rainbow trout and I was uh, found this Facebook group. They were like, hey, uh, they just stocked this pond with trout. Come fish, come hang out. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. So I get there and there's literally three of us. There's, there's like 200 people in the group and there's like three of us that show up. <laughs> and, and there's this one older guy, his name's Terry. And he was like, uh, he was fly fishing. I was like, man, that's cool. That's really cool. I've seen that in movies and stuff. <laughs> And he's like, you ought to try it. And I was like, man, uh, no, I kind of like just, you know, throwing jigs and stuff like that. He's like, no, really, you should try it. So I'm on my way to go get some fluorocarbon from uh, the sports store and uh, found this $45 fly combo. Mm -hmm. And uh, it started from there, dude. I caught a trout and then I lost all my flies. So I've been fly tying one day less than I've been fly fishing. 
Oh, wow. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I love that. I love the story every time I go back to that's why I kind of, you know, love hearing that because, you know, shout out to Terry. You know, it's always, there's always a person, you know, and sometimes it's early in life, sometimes it's later, but it seems like there's always a, like this mentor, right? The, the guy that's like, you know what, you just got to try it. And then they plant the seed and then you get into it. And, and now you're, I mean, man, you're tying, you're selling flies, right? You got all sorts of stuff going. How did, you know, um, before we jump into guard, just talk about that. How did you get to a point where you're thinking like I could, uh, you know, sell some flies and, and go in a little deeper? Well, dude, honestly, so I, I kind of, I sold soft plastics for a long time. And then, I, uh, you know, started the whole fly fishing thing, but I never intended on selling flies. I was like, this is, this is mine. You know, this is, this is yeah. selfishly mine for me, myself. This is pleasure. I'll never sell a fly. And, uh, I was live streaming one night and my buddy had some leg surgery and he was high as a kite on his pain <laughs> medicine. He's like, dude, let me buy some flies. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and He's like, well, I just sent you money, so you need to send me some flies. <laughs> so he bought some flies for his daughter. And then from there, uh, more people were just kind of like, hey, man, uh, let me get some flies. And I was like, dude, these kind of suck, you know. But um, so I would only really sell to friends until I, uh, I got comfortable selling a product that I could stand behind because I didn't just want to sell some bull crap. Uh, I yeah. wanted good, good hooks with good thread uh, that weren't going to blow up after two fish, something, you know, something that was durable. Yeah, I, I think durability over, you know, the aesthetic, um, <laughs> you know, for yeah. our eyes as the as the angler is far more important. I'd, yeah. I'd rather I'd rather have a, you know, a Clouser minnow that lasts 200, 300 fish, which is possible because my buddies, I have, I have a couple of buddies that tie some like that that they maybe the finish isn't as pretty but mm -hmm. they last i mean they last three four times as long as your normal box brand yeah so. i love that that's a great point that people don't think about that when they buy a fly they're like you know it, it works for a little bit and sometimes you know when you get a fish it, it tears up the fly that can work a little bit but you're bummed when that fly unravels and you're like oh man it's done right you got tossed in the trash so you're so you focus on tying flies that actually are going to last for, uh, you know, quite a while. And what, what type of flies? So, I mean, are you tying a little bit? I know you, you trout fishing is one thing. Do you tie kind of whatever or do you focus on something? So I've, my, my focus is streamers and primarily predator flies. Um, that's that's where I find the most joy with fly tying. I will tie. Um, I do tie a lot of Euro nymphs uh, for uh, trout season. If I'm not fishing streamers, I'm Euro nymphing. And, uh, I get my dry flies from my buddies out West. <laughs> yeah, totally. Okay. Um, so I love this and predator flies is always uh, a hot topic as is Euro nymph, you know, tying neuro, uh, Euro flies. But, uh, so let's talk predator. So, I mean, the gar, I want to dig into this gar. We'll, we'll get into some of the other stuff as we go, but let, let's just jump into the gar because it's a species that, you know, probably a lot of people maybe haven't fished for, but it's such a unique kind of a crazy looking fish, right? Um, do you know much about just the fish itself, the life history or kind of why it has those features, what it, what it does and all that stuff? Dude, I am, I am no expert by any means on gar. Um, they are, I mean, they're an incredibly old species. Uh, originally they were thought to be, uh, Esox like, Oh yeah. Like Musculange and Pike and you know, all those, get, yep. all those cool cats. But, they uh they were later uh put in the uh, lepus uh category um which is because of their primarily because of their back fins and like i said i'm no expert this is just sure no this is great we don't need you to be an expert just you know to give us what you have this is already this is already great love it um inc incredibly incredibly old species um man off the top of my head i want to say there's four or five species of gar in north america um alligator gar is the biggest freshwater boned fish we have in north america that's because sturgeon don't have the, the same bone structures and everything but uh absolutely just amazing fish yeah 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 i'm, I'm looking um i just you know probably shouldn't do this but i booted up the the wikipedia just to look at you know what i mean i check it out but yeah you're right the uh can't even say it. Uh, Lepi uh, Sostidae is the family. Yeah. Um, 
the only surviving members of the I begin I can't pronounce this you know some the only surviving member of the in the Holocene the ancient Holocene group of ray finned fish appeared during the Triassic 240 million years ago um, so it's yeah it's like this living it's like this remaining dinosaur essentially kind of I mean that's what it sounds like and it's got a mouth right that's the one thing it's very elongated like a torpedo um, it's like some of these other species but it, what's talk about that what, what's going on with the the head of the fish so. Um, you have short nose, spotted alligator and long nose primarily. And then you've got like Floridagar and some other like hybrid strains, but, um, your short nose is more of this quite literally. It's a, it's a blunted shorter snout, but it has the same teeth structure as a long nose gar. So it's those, uh, fine rows of, uh, or row more or less of, uh, needle, needle like teeth. Um, and then your long nose, they have the incredibly long, uh, snouts, uh, given the name long nose. And that, that's my favorite one right there. So, I mean, if you can think like kitchen tongs with teeth, that's, that's them. It. And they, uh, <laughs> they eat really, it, it's really cool how they eat. Um, and they all kind of gulp air also their swim bladders are very special and they, they play the same role as a dolphin in our ecosystems here in our freshwater watersheds. Wow. Which is what, what is that role? Um, more or less, uh, they, they take care of a lot of invasive species, actually. Um, they, their primary forage is bait fish as well. So there, there's a lot of, uh, misnomers about, oh, they eat all my bass. Well, right. if, you're, if your bass fry stay two to three inches for their whole life, then yeah, they would eat your bass, but they, they, they're going to eat some, of course, and they're going to eat some, you know, crappie and buffalo and all these other fish, but. Their primary forage is, you know, your four to six inch uh, shad, at least yeah. here in this watershed. Other other places, it might be minnows or chubs or what what have you. But they're very small fish. They themselves are large fish, but they eat very small fish. So. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's partly because, I mean, I'm thinking, how big do these gar typically? Like, what would be a big gar? Uh, so, I would say, once again, no expert here. Um, you know, your spots, I would say a large, like an actual really large spotted gar would be three and a half feet plus. Like that's a really good size for them. Uh, your your top end long nose, you're looking probably 60 inches, 62 inches, 25 pounds or so. Right, right. 25, 30. And then uh, alligator gar are just, they are just giant, literal giants. I mean, you've got 150, 200, oh, wow. 250 pounds. No kidding. And are people fly fishing for those? Yes. Yes, they are. Nice. And, and in your area, so you're in Texas. What what part of Texas are you in? I'm in Northeast Texas. Uh, I'm in a little place called, well, not so little. I'm in uh, Texarkana is where oh, I am. Yeah, really nice. Like yeah. Right Smokey on. and the Bandit, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, that, that's a pretty uh, pretty famous place. It's it, Texas is, uh, you know, Texas is huge, and, right? It's amazing. It's it, tex I mean, I guess that's kind of one of the cool things about Texas is it's it's its own thing, right? It's kind of diverse as you go around the state. But what makes Texarkana, what, what do you like about, you know, what's cool about living there? Uh, just the gar. <laughs> is it? Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just the gar. Just the gar. Okay. So, so these huge, so you got these giant gar and then where you're at, are you able to get all three of these species? So I can get, I could, but alligator gar kind of, they're really scarce in uh, the river that I primarily fish. And, um, honestly, I'm not really equipped <laughs> to, all right. get, to get after, yeah. uh, alligator gar. You, you do need at a minimum a 12 weight. Right. Yeah. They're giants. Um, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. And for, uh, you know, long nose, you can, you can kind of get away with uh, 10 weights, sometimes eight weights. If you know that they are primarily smaller fish, you can do eight weights. But uh, I wouldn't recommend anything lower than a 10, personally. 10, yeah. Are people out there, like, specifically, you know, guiding? Or can you find guides that will take you out for gar fishing? Uh, one of my best friends uh, does a very limited, it is, I'm not going to say it's uh, exclusive, right, but it's a very limited guide service. I do walk, uh, no way. <laughs> I yeah. do, I do walk trips for gar here at the river. Yeah. So you, so you actually do. So if somebody was interested and they, you know, want to check this out, they could contact you and maybe grab a trip. Yeah. There, there is a, I mean, given 
time constraints currently. Um, I'm probably not going to be guiding this next season. Gotcha. But as if they'd like to come up as a friend, um, I'd be more than happy to teach, mentor, and hopefully help them catch some. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, it's just leaving the opportunity. I, it's always nice to, you know, especially if somebody's maybe down in your neck of the woods. We have quite a few listeners in Texas, so I'm sure there's some people listening here that are interested. Um, so l- let's dig into on the GAR. I mean, it's very interesting. Obviously, you, you just broke down a little on high level of the species, but um, let's dig into the fishing. So if you take it like today, well, let's start there, I guess, timing wise. Does it matter when you go or when is the best time to hit GAR? Um, hot. When it is too hot for you to want to be out fishing is the perfect time to be fishing for gar. Oh, wow. Yep. So um, hot, hot. So, so like right now is a great time. What, what is it today? What's the temperature today? Uh, I haven't checked this morning to be honest, but I would imagine it's going to get into mid nineties or around 90. We just had two days of rain. So it's probably going to get around 90 today. Our water temps are sitting in the eighties. Jeez. So, um, they're loving it right now. And yeah. <laughs> And since we've been uh, so tight on rain, gar like clean, calm water. That's what they really like. So they get they get one of those here in Texas. They get calm water. That's what they absolutely love. So since I fish lower end behind a dam and it's not generating because there's there's we had no rain. There's no reason to push water into the lower river. So they're they're kind of stacking up in places. The, where they usually are, but the the numbers are much greater now. So I mean, it's it's pretty prime fishing. Yeah, pretty prime. Well, so in the dam. So you're saying, and you're fishing. This is all river fishing, just but finding like slower rivers. Is that what it is? Yes, typically. Um, I mean, this this river is maybe a hundred foot wide at the mouth um, below the dam. So you know, even when they're pushing like if they're pushing like three thousand cfs, that's pretty significant for that's you know that. Oh, yeah that watershed and they do that sometimes i mean last year the river was 35 feet higher than it is right now wow Jeez. yeah yeah and um that, i mean that's just that's just what it was but it, that we're actually sitting at normal pool we're, we're about four feet below normal pool right now but uh you can i mean i even called the gar last year uh in that uh, in that extreme cfs uh, more or less just kind of swinging them mm. So on the dam, so you use the dam because that backs up the water and you're fishing above the dam, upstream of the dam? Either above or below, which whichever section has more suitable water. And being that you can stand on top of the dam and look down, you can kind of pick which one that is for the day. Oh, okay. You know, if you've, if, you, if you've got a lot of wind and chop on one side, I don't like throwing uh, big flies for hours in the wind. I'll do it. But if I can get away with, less wind on the other side of the dam i'll go fish that (laughs) yeah yeah that's awesome so so basically you want calm water the river you know a dam is great and and how do you know and i'm assuming this is a pretty popular river that you're fishing or or, or, are gar kind of found everywhere are there only a few places you know what's that look like so uh gar are very very widespread throughout the u.s i don't know the exact number of states but I mean, you can even find gar on some of the smaller uh, tribs of the Great Lakes. Um, I mean, you've you've got them um, all the way up north. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But the further you go west, like California, I'm not sure that California has gar. So for all you guys out there listening, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. There's a, there. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll fact. We'll, we'll add some resources in the uh, in the show notes here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they've got a really wide range. Yeah, yeah, they're all over the place. So, well, let's take it to the to the river. So we're coming up to the river. You're looking for calm water. Once you find that calm water, what is your like? What's the next step? How are you finding the fish? Or talk about how you're presenting your fly to these fish. All right. So I get down to the river. I'm geared up, and the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to kind of scope it out like I'm fishing dries. Uh, I'm looking for rising fish, but the thing is, they're not actually eating um, on top of the water. I mean, some, sometimes they, they will, but well, I mean, we're not going to open that can of worms. Yeah. So when they're coming <laughs> up, they're gulping, but they're actually, we call it gulping because they're gulping air. They're actually taking air into their swim bladders. And, um, like I said, they kind of play the same role as dolphins. So they can live in 
just to go back, I said they like clean water, but they're not afforded that opportunity very often. So their ability to breathe air lets them live in literal mud puddles if they have to. Right. So, oh, um, but amazing. we're going back, back to the river now. Um, if you see fish gulping, that's a good indicator. Of course, not only that you have fish, but that they are moving through the water column. So that means maybe I don't have to fish a heavier fly or maybe I don't have to fish a full sink or an intermediate today. Maybe I can get away with a floating. And then something else to look for is if you see gar close to the surface in pairs, they're probably spawning. And typically their spawn is around, uh, depending on how warm your water is, around May. And you don't have to worry about fishing long nose gar. I'm going to say long nose specifically when they're spawning. Um, if you don't know, right, it's, it's not like uh, it's not like raking reds um, yeah. Yeah. for trout. And I'm not saying that because the species isn't important. I'm saying because they won't eat. They will not eat. They have one thing on their mind. You don't you don't get to be a, a prehistoric creature yeah. and be stupid. So their their programming is very, very um defined. It says, hey, when we're spawning, we're spawning. We don't we're not eating. We're not doing anything else. We're spawning. Yeah. So uh you don't have to worry about all that. But yeah, I so I fish if you're trying to break records, which maybe that's your thing. If you are, I would highly, highly recommend starting out not trying to break records with gar. Um, and I say that because long nose, you have a lot of what well, will go into flies, but well, yeah. just talking about leaders specifically here. Um, if you're trying to follow the IGFA standards for class tippet and you've never fought a big long nose gar or any gar for the matter, um, there's a good chance that uh, you're going to break that off the first few times. And some of these flies we use um, have rope in them to help facilitate that uh, that actual catch because their mouths are so mm. bony. Yeah, uh, right. al al alligator gar, you can't use rope at all. There's oh. no there's no rope. It's so the rope is tangles up and hooks them with it tangling in their mouth. More or less, it's like flossing. You can catch them on really sharp, thin hooks, like really thin, like a size two Aberdeen salt hooks, like the Aberdeen style, but they have to be razor sharp. And um, sometimes they just keep enough pressure on the, on the streamers to where you can actually land them on regular streamers. It happens all the time. But uh, if you break that fish off with that leader because you didn't tie the right knots or you didn't use the right tippet, uh, you're going to kill that fish. It won't be able to open its mouth. Um, they have a chance to shed the fly, which is, uh, we'll go into talking about how I tie my flies here in a little bit, I guess. But um, if your fly is too dense, you, you killed the fish. And yeah. that's, that sucks. Oh, wow. That really sucks. Wow. I mean, there, there's no going back. So this is literally a, an all in kind of fishing. You have to have the right knots. You have to have the right leaders. Could you use like uh, go with like the the metal tippet, you know that sort of thing? You absolutely could. Uh, you could use bite wire. You can use bite tippet. Um, I recommend you you don't um, don't use more strength tippet on your line. I mean, this might be a no brainer, and people be like, "Oh yeah, of course. Why would I do that?" But um, you don't think about that the Dacron cord or the different cores in a lot of these fly lines are only rated for thirty pounds. So if you're, if you're like, well, man, I don't want to break this fish off. Well, if you have a 50 pound, uh, butt section to your leader to help turn these flies, which I do, I use 50 pound. Okay. And then you go down to even let's say 30 pound, uh, for your tippet down to, uh, you know, like a fast hatch or a loop knot or what have you, if you crank your drag down and they take that fly and you set into them, <laughs> you're going to strip your fly line and that's that's even more of a problem now <laughs> hmm. so yeah. so th there's a there's a lot of consideration into uh the line set up even more than you know fly design or presentation yeah 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 gotcha okay so well let's talk and again i, I want to get narrow species because we've got and I, I did look up the alligator gar in california it is a uh, invasive species there are they've they have found some there but i don't think uh, there's any other gar really 
uh, you know, so there's probably some break, I'm sure, you know, whatever it is, maybe it's the Rocky mountains where they're not, you know, coming out West, but, uh, that's my guess <laughs> again, not knowing. <laughs> um, so let's see here. So basically, you know, species wise. So if we're talking here, what, what are we talking about? Let's just focus on a species just to make sure if somebody wants to get the gear and the, and the, you know, leader set up. Okay. So when we're talking about rope flies, which is long nose, that that's, that's what I pursue primarily is long nose guard. Okay. Let's go. Let's stick with long nose then. Everything that we've spoken about up to this point applies to long nose. Um, pretty much not specifically, but everything that we've spoken about applies to it. Today's episode is sponsored by Fairflies, founded with the idea of finding ethical solutions to fly time materials and products. They've done just that by creating jobs for marginalized groups, both in the U.S. and abroad. They are experts, innovators, and artisans of exceptional fishing products. I've noted that I've connected with Jeff uh, a number of times a while back, and we, we had a connection right at the front, and it's been a good time now finally putting this together and hearing the story. We had Jeff on a podcast, and we heard about their 5D brushes and what it's all about, why brushes are a game changer in the fly tying space, making things faster, easier, more consistent, and, uh, and they got it going. So the nice thing about what Fairfly has going is they've got not only the materials, but they got tools. Now they own Wasatch Custom Angling Tools and are carrying on the tradition of hand-making heirloom quality fly tying tools. With over 50 tools, this is truly the do-it-yourself company. You can get all your tools and fly tying materials right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash fairflies, F-A-I-R-F-L-I-E-S. Check them out right now. You support this podcast by checking out that link to Fairflies. Okay, back to the show. And then what about the gear on this? So so you have, let's just finish that leader up. So you're setting yeah. your leader up. Let's go into leader, fly line, rod, reel. Let's do that real quick. All right. So um, I use uh, big game fly line, whatever kind you want, because that core is not that 30 pound. Uh, I, I recommend if I only had to have one line, I would get an intermediate. I would get intermediate to floating is what I would get. If I could only get one rod, it would be a 12 weight. And of course, with that comes a 12 weight reel. You don't need sealed drag, but you need something with a good drag that has no high spots in it. Something very smooth. Okay. Nine foot, nine foot, 12 weight. Uh, I'd probably say nine foot. You could go shorter. You know, like if you, like if you're a musky guy and you've got a chippy stick, um, that's like eight six. That that's going to be just fine. And then they, I mean, those dudes already know that. But yep. Okay. And then how do you break down that leader? So you start with a fifty pound butt. What what's how long is it? What's it look like to the tippet? So that that depends on the size of the fly, honestly, that I'm throwing. But typically, uh, I'm running about a foot and a half of fifty pound with a perfection loop uh so it's loop to loop or you can nail knot it uh whatever way you want to do it if you're if your loop on your fly line looks kind of sketchy <laughs> you're going to want to nail knot that okay. <laughs> uh but so it's a foot and a half of 50 down to um 30 or 25 the less amount of knots you can have uh the better it's going to be okay uh, you can use, uh, you know, like the UV cures for your knots. Uh, you just want it to be able to get through your guides smooth. Uh, so worst case, you have to land that fish by yourself. Right. Um, if you have to pull that fish up to where you can grab it, if you have to come up in your guides, you want that to be, because the knot's not going to be small. It's, I mean, these are big lines. It doesn't matter how you mm -hmm. tie it. Yeah. 50 pound. That's huge. And is this, yeah. is this 50 pound, uh, a floral carbon or, or what do you got? Uh, so I actually use monofilament because fluoro is so dang expensive right now. And uh, I, I wouldn't skimp on cheaper fluorocarbon. Uh, we're not, you know, we're not trying to full trout. We're trying to catch, catch, you know, these fish aren't line shy by any means. We're just trying to make sure that it's a sustainable line. So yeah. Well, what's your tippet? What, what's your leader material when you're building this out? What, which do you like a certain brand? So honestly, dude, I'm trying to find it. Yeah, I was going to say Maxima is the one for steelhead here. We don't go quite to, uh, you know, but we use, you know, 30 pound. You'll use that for some of the butt sections at times. Well, I, I love the Maxima. I'm pretty sure it is Maxima, to be yeah, honest. Chameleon. Maxima Chameleon. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so Maxima Chameleon. I just run that all the way down. And then you can use, if you wanted to, you could use like AFW, bite wire, like 40 pound or uh, a long nose is probably not going to bite your line off. But oh, okay. 
Um, but there is always a chance, you know, it's like, uh, a cat, you know, like a house cat typically wouldn't, you know, kill somebody, but there's always that chance, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, especially the house cats you have around there, right? We oh, might dude, get into that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, fair we, we you mentioned the the cats you have laid around there yeah. <laughs> but uh well let's finish up this leader so you got yeah. uh you got what and how long is the 30 pound section so the 30 pound section uh typically is about another uh three feet to three and a half so i i try not to run more than five to six feet total because i am trying to turn really big flies some days oh nice yeah so that's it so pretty much you've got a short 50 pound 30 pound and the 30 pound is your tippet for the most part yeah, the 30 pound is my tippet, and I actually tie off to a Mustad size three fast edge. Okay. Which is uh, the size threes are 75 pound. Um, we we use them for musky and pike and all that stuff. They, they hold up really, really well. You're going to need uh, like a set of hemostats or something to open them up to actually change your flies. But uh, they're great. Describe that again on the Mustad. So you got your tippet, and then you're, what are you tying on to that tippet? So it's, it's a, uh, it's called a fast atch, not a hatch, but a fast atch and, uh, must add oh, atch fast atch. Yeah. And must add make some, they are, there they are. I have some sitting on my desk. Uh, the size three, like I said, are 75 pounds. I wish I could just show you a picture of this, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll put a, I'll put a link in the show notes and so somebody can take a look and they can grab yeah. these. I see. Yeah. It's kind of like just a metal clip or whatever. Yeah, it's just the it's just the metal, uh, like you said, it's just a metal clip. There's no swivel or anything like that. But yeah. since the loop is so big on the bottom, to where your flies connect, it actually kind of gives you that same loop knot motion. Believe it or not, to your fly. Exactly, what you love, and then you just tie your fly on with you just slip your fly right onto that metal piece. Yeah, you just flip slip it on in the metal. Yeah, and then essentially it's a loop. Then essentially you have action like you would with an open loop knot. Yeah. And that way, if you're using wire specifically, you're not having to cut back your wire every time to tie another perfection loop or yeah. however you, whatever you do with your wire section. So th this just saves you a lot of, it saves you a lot of time and resources. Well, that's cool. So we got the leader. So, and then let's go into, let's go into flies because this is going to be a piece I wanted to dig into for sure on this. Um, so give us, uh, we're talking gar, give us your top few. I'm not sure if you only need one fly or if you have a few flies you want to give a shout out to. Well, my, uh, my buddy Ryan's been working on one. I'll, I'll tell you guys the name and I'll, he's calling it the Garmageddon. Nice. Um, it's not officially out or released yet. He's been doing a lot of, a lot of R and D on it. You know, he's, okay. he, he is a true believer in if it doesn't fish, then I'm not going to sell it, which everyone should. You shouldn't sell flies you don't believe in. But the thing is about his flies, it's suitable for alligator gar, long nose gar, and any other fish that eats big streamers. So it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty amazing fly. Um, that, that will be the number one when he officially releases okay. it. Yeah, so you've used the Garmageddon before. Uh, I have seen it, and I have seen him using it. I have not personally fished that myself. I've been tying my own uh, gar flies because I'm, I'm trying to design some stuff myself, you know? Yeah. You know, Ryan's kind of my mentor in a lot of ways. Uh, like, I'm trying to beat the state record gar. Oh, really? Not because I want the record, but because I want to beat Ryan. Because <laughs> Ryan... He has it. Yeah, he has he has alligator gar on the fly, state record, and he has alligator, long, not alligator, but long nose gar on the fly state record oh wow no so alligator so he's got the big like how big was that state record dude i don't exactly remember but i want to say it was like 55 or 56 pounds yeah wow so you've got a mentor that's like he's the yeah he's the guy you've got the best guy as a mentor yeah he he is the dude he's very humble too well, what's his name yeah i was gonna say is he a guy you can't really find he's not in the industry roy uh many moon ago he was kind of in the industry but now he's he's kind of taking a a back seat on stuff if you really want to learn about gar, like be a true gar nerd, then you should check out his name is Ryan King. Uh, his Instagram handle is Professor Rivers. He is a wealth of knowledge and he's willing to share. But his our big thing together is conservation of the species. 
you know, we love fishing for them and we love taking people to fish for them, but we're trying to preserve what we have. So, and one of the only ways to really do that is to change the, the vision of that fish, you know, take it from being a trash fish, which a lot of anglers presume because it's just, like I said, it's, it's misnomers and it's, it's wives tales and it's just bad information yeah, in, in lack of education on the species. Right. And the only way to change that is to make it a, a trophy fish. That's cool. That, I, I love that. And I think you're right. I mean, I think that there's a lot of species that are thought of as trash fish, but the cool thing I think about fly fishing especially is, is that maybe 20 years ago that was the case, but I think now everybody just feels like all species are, there's no trash fish anymore. I mean, do you feel like, it feels like that from my end, like people can fish for anything and it's great, right? Like carp, yeah. carp dude. used to be the trash fish and now it's like, it's the bone fish of, of freshwater, right? Dude, it is. And you know, and, uh, it's funny because I've got friends they are like, yeah, dude, when we're getting ready to go fish salmon out West or up in Alaska, we go carp fishing for like a month. Oh, wow. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, we go carp fishing for a month, dude, because he's like, they're sewer salmon, bro. He's like, yeah, sewer salmon. Nice. Yeah. He's like, they, they, they pull like a salmon. It's like, it's the same kind of fight. He said, it really gets you prepared. He said, other than, you know, your strip set, he said, everything else is like fighting salmon. I was like, I, I said, I'll have to, you know, do that myself to figure it out. But yeah, uh, I thought that was really interesting when he said that. So <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah, it's funny. Nice. Well, I, I, I think the guard, like I said, I remember my buddy telling me about him a lot, quite a while ago and it was just always interesting. It's one of those. And now we I've talked today. I mean, it's like an ancient historic fish. So I would imagine you know, they do need the protection and conservation. And um, yeah, maybe we'll get into that at the end. But yeah. Would you give a shout out? Are there any conservation groups out there actually focusing on them? Uh, so Ryan is kind of, he's uh, he's doing a lot of work with Baylor and the state of uh, Texas mm -hmm. to kind of change a lot of these regulations because alligator gar are threatened. They are not endangered yet, but they are actually, a, it's a threatened species. Oh, wow. They're on the ESA list. They're actually yeah, on it. they are. All right. There you go. They are. And um, it didn't used to be like that, but uh, through uh, a lot of sadly just bad angling uh, all around, you know, of what, what happened is I'm not blaming anyone, of course, but, sure. you know, there was a show that came out where this guy caught this, it was on Discovery Channel. And uh, he caught an absolute brute of an alligator gar and people are like, Oh my God, that exists. And they're like, hold up. That's, that's in the States. That's not uh, so yeah, that's that not fishery, tropical. yeah, that fish, uh, that fishery exploded. And what happened was then people were like, Oh, can we bow fish for them? And they're like, well, yeah, it's legal. And, oh, wow. with, and within the means of legality, do it, you know, you're allowed to do, I, I mean, right uh, do what you want to do but through through that it's it's become threatened so damn damn that's it that's so it's a yeah and, and I, definitely here we'll we'll give a shout out to i mean ryan i think that's a great one if anybody wants to help learn more about that i think ryan they could check in with with him and he can maybe direct them how people can help right you know either volunteer yeah. or get some i'm sure because i had no idea either and i'm sure a lot of people don't know that um, well, let's, let's keep this going on where we're at. So we okay. got, we got the gear we got, we're talking a little on fly. So you mentioned the one, so we got the gar, the Garmageddon. So give us a, a few, cause I want to get into a little bit on fly design. Um, and as we go, just, we mentioned this, um, like fair flies, the brushes, that was yes. what, the connection that we had originally here. I mean, are there, are you tying any of these gar flies with like the, the brushes? Yeah. Some ones that Instagram has never seen. <laughs> Yeah. Um, not because like the material's bad or anything like that, just because I'm kind of safeguarding it until I get it fine tuned. Mm -hmm. And um, it is using Fairfly's fly fur. Oh, the fly fur, right. As, as well as rope. So um, for anybody that doesn't know, you, your craft furs are your synthetic marabou. Will it ever replace marabou? No. No, it can't replace the natural, but it is the closest thing you can get to marabou without having marabou. And why is it, why is the fly fur? Because I get that marabou is amazing, right? It's that yeah. material that's just like, yeah, there's no way. But how is like this fly fur, say, better? Is it just more durable? Like, or it how is. would it be better? It is. that That is the only facet that I recommend craft fur. And 
And you can't really shape marabou with, uh, let's say, a glue or a resin for a streamer head or something like that. You, you could, but it's taking away from its properties. So, but with craft furs or fly furs, you can shape and craft them literally however you want. Uh, you can make it a high and tight head for a jerk fly. You can make it a, a nice fat round head for a sucker or for uh, a big head minnow or any other bait fish pattern. So there's, there's pros and cons to each, but why the, the fly fur also breathes underwater and the fly fur differs from craft fur uh, in a couple of different ways is it retains a little bit more water, which actually helps with, um, you know, self-weighted streamers, not necessarily like putting uh, lead eyes, making a lead head streamer, but if, if your streamer is killed correctly and that craft fur or fly fur, in this instance, the fly fur is actually going to help get it down to that zone a little bit easier and a little bit faster without creating such that drastic U in the fly line. Because if you throw sink tips and um, sink tips, full sinks, so there is going to be a U in your fly line at some point. Right. And how you get that out, of, of course, is that, that first strip. But that alleviates that uh, just a little bit faster because um, it holds a little bit more water. But the, the coolest thing about it is it's probably the longest. Now, I mean, people can hit me up on Instagram and tell me I'm wrong yeah. because I've been wrong before. But to my knowledge and to everything I've tied with up to this point, it's the longest synthetic craft fur that I've ever seen. It's four and a half inches. I mean, that is that is a very, very long synthetic fur. And it lets you make some absolute giant flies with great profiles without having to use a ton of material. And instead of having to, you know, take three or four stacks of craft fur to make, you know, like this six and a half, seven inch bait fish pattern, uh -huh. you can use two. Yeah. Because you, you have that length. So it, it affords you the opportunity to do a lot of really cool things that you can't do with other furs. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. And so on these fly fur is definitely a, a good one. Can you give us a, like a fly somebody can look at? Is there a name pattern somebody could look at maybe that doesn't necessarily have to have fly fur, but just has, the, is one of these gar flies that, that we're talking about here? So Ryan, uh, Ryan uses a, uh, that's kind of who got me on the uh, fair flies is stuff like to the actual materials was Ryan. He's like, yeah, dude, I, I use that for some of my stuff. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll check it out. And, you know, that was literally right around the same time that I, I had the opportunity to meet up with some of the guys from Fairflies and test out some of their materials. And they said, hey, would you be interested in being a, uh, a tying ambassador for us? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we worked all that out. And that, that's how I ended up getting with Fairflies. But, but if you just want to see it in action, you can go check out the Fairflies Instagram. Um, okay. And... Um, they have a lot of really awesome flies there that a lot of us uh, tires for them have tied. Uh, you've got like Justin Carnes with 317 flies. He, he's used a lot of their fly furs. People are doing like clousers, musky flies, pipe flies. Right. It's all sorts of stuff. So all the stuff that you think of as the the biggest flies for predator fresh that you could yeah. use. Yeah. Okay. So any of those, the, and if you had to say the one, the Gar Magennan, uh, or something similar. Describe that. How how is like? Give us a, a picture. I know you can't let the secret out, but what would be something? Similar? I'm just trying to get to that point. Like, what is a gar potential? Like a top gar fly versus say a, a clouser or something else. Okay, so I'm sorry. I didn't mean to beat around the bush. I, I just yeah. get off on a lot of tangents. Oh, good. My, my the <laughs> the hamster in my brain's working overtime right now. Yeah. So uh, the key with a good, let's say, a rope streamer, right? For gar, and they don't have to be pretty. Gar are not the most intelligent species ever, right? Um, it's it's mostly about profile, and then it's about color and speed, right? So, gotcha. Uh, actually, I, I probably put speed before even color for gar fishing. Okay. So, um, as long as it has a good bait fish profile, uh, they're probably gonna they're gonna key in on it. But if it's got the right speed and the right motion. Like, hey, I'm going to I'm going to do these uh, small twitch strips. Right. Tommy Lynch said something really funny about those, but I'm not going to. Oh, that. yeah. <laughs> oh, from, from the episode we did with him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. He's, he's a piece of work. <laughs> yeah. 
but some they, they like different presentations and that's just like any fish so sometimes they like the the over under rod tip in the water uh rod under your arm salt water strip mm. and yep. sometimes they like just dead drifts and you know it, it all depends oh, wow. but the, the real the real key to a good gar fly is how sparse you can make your material for two reasons um one it casts a lot better two uh it hooks up it actually hooks up better yeah and for the third reason is removal of the fly from the mouth you know a lot of a lot of people might not like the idea of rope being in a fish's mouth and that's kind of your best way to catch them so uh but the best way to alleviate that mess is have a sparse fly and i mean actually sparse right and by rope you mean john on this so you've got this fly tied and within it it's got some materials that are kind of like ropier that catch up in the teeth is that what you're talking about here yes yes so it's specifically it's nylon rope yeah so um nylon rope it catches up in the teeth and you what you can do with those materials is you can do you you could do a stack of rope you could do a stack of fur you could do a another stack of rope and then another stack of fur and then another stack of rope and that would be depending on how you lay out the fly and how much material you're using, it could be a very sparse fly with a lot of movement and action. And it's probably, probably going to get eaten. Um, so I tie these flies when I would take clients or people that are just relatively newer to fly fishing, I would tie them on uh, shanks and I make my own shanks out of 053 stainless steel wire. I have a wire bender. And I, I make my own shanks that way. It's just a, it's a closed uh, loop on one end and then to a straight shank, or you can just do double loops. But, um, and then you, you can just tie them like that, or you can tie them on 25 nail Waddington shanks if that's easier for you to get a hold of. I, I know not everyone ties uh, their own shanks. <laughs> right. So, yep. But Waddington shanks work very well because they're long enough to perform what needs to be done. And you can also probably find some shanks from Spawn. Uh, spawn fly fish they make a lot of really long shanks oh, okay so there's a lot of companies you could tie on and because that hook isn't necessary but if you're a little bit more experienced angler and you're not sure if it's just gar kind of where you are it's never just gar right but um if i'm tying them for myself i tie them on three aught hooks very sparse on uh, three aught uh, stinger hooks because it turns out that hybrid hybrid striped bass you know wipers or stripers whatever oh, yeah. you want to call them yeah uh they like the same flies so <laughs> and they're there and there's a bunch of speed yeah so you have those guys there as well yeah yeah we have we have those here as well and then catfish eat the flies drum bass uh i mean because it's just the gotcha. four to six inch typically right. four to six inch bait fish imitation yeah so you're out there so taking it back to the water you're fishing you see these gar moving you know, maybe they're doing the work and you see them breathing on the surface and then you can target them. But are you also just, like you said, casting out there and you don't even know what you're going to hook up with? Yeah, you don't even know what you're going to hook up with. So sight fishing gar is super cool or you blind casting is a lot of fun too. Blind casting is more, I mean, it takes a lot more time to get the quality fish blind casting to them. But sight fishing for gar is really, really exhilarating because um, as they come up, or as they're kind of sitting subsurface, you actually have to make that really fine, precise cast. And because, or they'll spook. Oh, so wow. how do you, how do you make a fine, precise cast when you're using 30 pound tippet? So when you're using 30 pound tippet, uh, believe it or not, I stop my cast. I try to try to stem my line coming down at that angle, you know, for that fly first presentation, I actually stop it high. And I try to get, you know, three or four feet in front uh, adjacent to them. So if let's say the nose, if you're looking from the tail to the nose of the gar, and that is your zero degree mark, uh, I try to get that 45 degrees off of either right or left of them because their eyes on their, are on the side of their head. So as they eat, they actually snap their head left or right to eat. Um, if the fly is directly in front of them, they can't see it. Oh, right. So they're not going to eat it. So yeah. you get that 40, 45, either left or right. And I try to get three or four feet ahead. And the reason it's that 45 and not that direct 90, you, if, if you have the opportunity for that 90 degree, 
um, off of their left or right, then that's probably even more ideal. But realistically, you get that 45 way more often. Um, you stop the cast high and you let it drop. Yeah. So it flutters. So it kind of floats down. And just yeah, like, it kind of yeah. kind of floats down. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It, it floats down and it hits. And then that gives you a chance to, if they don't spook there, then that gives you your chance to strip it into their sight line and put the magic on them and see if they're going to eat. And what's really cool is that these fish will even eat if your boat, if you're uh, fishing from a vessel, they'll eat in the figure eight, which is a ton of fun. No kidding. Uh, yeah, they'll eat in the eight. And um, it's it's so much fun. But, but blind casting, blind casting still water takes a little bit more. It's a lot more fan casting, uh, trying to figure out depths. Because if you see them actively gulping for air, you know they're there. So as they gulp, you can come up and sometimes they will just eat as they gulp. And that's a lot of fun because that's explosive. I mean, it's literally, it's a blow up like no other. Though I mean, <laughs> the water is just shot in the air. It's loud. It's very, very visual. And then your line goes tight and it's like, holy crap, man. Wow. And, um, but it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's just a lot of that fan casting and working depths and trying to figure out okay. what's, what's the retrieve, what depth are they at today? And, yeah. um, you might catch a small one like right off the top and then you might catch a small one, uh, four or five feet down. Yeah. In a normal day, if you're out there fishing, I mean, how, like how many species might you catch in that day? Are you just as broad or are you a lot of days you might only catch gar and that's, you could focus on them. So I, I've been very fortunate and I've had several days where it's only gar, but I've also had a lot of really also fortunate in a lot of other ways to catch, you know, like some big drum and stuff as well on some of these flies. Yeah. Um, gar, it's, it's kind of weird. Um, it's sometimes they, when they hit the fly, it's more of a pull than like a slam. And you, you'd have to fish for them to understand what I mean by that. Right. Like a pull, like somebody grabs your, grabs your shirt and just kind of slowly yanks on it. Yeah. Well, not necessarily even slowly, but it, it's different. It's not like a, it's not like they ate it. It's like it's in their mouth and they're pulling it away from you and then they're going to start swimming. Oh, but gotcha. uh, that's for long, that's for long nose alligator gar. When they hit it, you know, they hit it. Yeah. Alligators. Gotcha. Yeah. So, okay. So you painted the picture pretty good here. It's basically, you know, finding the fish. That's one way to do it. And if, if they're not, if you're not seeing them coming up for air or, or are you always, do you not fish unless you see them coming up for air at some point? No. So if, if you have a hot spot to where you kind of know, uh, like maybe you've seen, maybe you drove past this piece of water on your way home and you looked, looked off this overpass, you know, like we all do, we all look at water as anglers when we drive yep. by and we're like, man, I want to fish that but maybe you saw um, a lot of gar there and you're like, man, this weekend uh, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to try to catch some. Mm, well, gotcha. they, they might not be there, but there's a good chance that there's still going to be a few there. There you go. So you're always looking. So when you're driving down the road, you're always looking for gar. Dude, I am, especially here. <laughs> <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Trestle with their CRC system. It provides secure, convenient storage for your fully rigged fly rods with unsurpassed gear protection. Every CRC system comes with a secure uh, mounting clamp system, padding in the reel compartment, and their proprietary rod liner suspension system. This is a very uh, a pain point for as a lot of us, you know, your 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 uh, hook gets stuck in there and you can't get it out. That's definitely a pain. So they figured that one out. And uh, it's all about making it easier and faster to get on the water and having your rod fully rigged, whether you're on the salt water, whether you're in California, Colorado, New York, it doesn't really matter. If you want your rod to be ready to go, the CRC system will do that, whether on top of your rig, on the side, or in the back of your car. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash trestle right now to get started. T-R-X-S-T-L-E. You support this podcast by clicking over through that link to trestle okay back to the show okay so i give us a little snippet on this and we might circle around if we have a little time here at the end but i wanted to um and i do want to talk a little more about some of the fly tying stuff because i definitely uh, the fly fur I, that, this is the first i've heard really about some of the fly fur which is cool um but let's talk about the podcast real quick i, I can't miss you know an opportunity working class uh, fly fishing podcast because I totally forgot that, you know what I mean? Like you mentioned that before, 
But talk about that real quick. How, how, you know, why did you start a podcast? Oh, dude. Uh, so it's, I mean, won't talk about it a, a, a whole lot. Um, yeah. But it's working class fishing. And it was, it was started out of, um, I don't know, a little bit of punk rock roots. Uh, we were kind of, kind of upset a little bit at some fly shops which you're finding less and less uh, bad interactions, I would say, at fly shops nowadays. But, yep. you know, at the time, there was, uh, we just, I don't know, kind of had some bad interactions. We we're like, man, that's that's gatekeeping. That's keeping people out of the sport. So, that like, there was this perceived inaccessibility to fishing. And uh, we just kind of wanted to debunk that and let people know, like, it doesn't matter what you're fishing with. Uh, you can just get out and go fish and have fun. So, uh, you know, it's, we do a lot of, well, we did a lot of information uh, type podcasts, like, Hey, these are budget setups and all this. Yep. And then, and it's not just fly fishing. It's, it's any fishing. It's oh, for cool. any angler. Um, yep. Nice. And then uh, we have a lot of, a lot of really cool people on uh, met a lot of really awesome friends there. So, yeah. So you guys do a, is this a, like a weekly show or how, how often do you do it? Yeah. So it's, it's weekly. Yeah. So weekly and each week. So you have a, you might have a, a guest or you mix it up and is it just who's doing the show? Who's the, who are the hosts? Uh, so it's myself and my uh, really good friend, Brian. We, we run the podcast together. It's yeah, it's uh, we, it's posted every Monday and it's typically guests. Now uh, we realize that people don't really care to just listen to me and Brian. Um, yeah just talk crap yeah <laughs> that's the same <laughs> same for me too you know if i yeah. came in and tried to talk about gar makeup something that would be good but this has been a good show um okay so and then so you have the podcast going and how long have you guys been uh, doing this uh a little over a year i think we're yeah, coming up year. on a year okay. and a half i think we're coming yeah, up so on a year and a half here pretty soon oh good so you're over the you're over the 50 episode mark yeah or uh, just about just about yeah, because just about. we weren't we weren't it wasn't um is a uh, weld oil machine now as it was uh, back in the day it was kind of whenever we could record but now we've made it a point to ourselves to where that's part of our routine to record so uh, i think we're, we're coming up pretty close on 50 episodes how do you and i like to ask this question just because i like to get more people into podcasting you know when when i can but uh was it you know getting into the tech like did you guys it sounds like you guys do zoom uh do you like microphones and things like that are you guys all tech or how did the guests come in so we we do use zoom we used to you know we used to have the nice microphones and all that stuff and then uh you know like computer life happens you know yeah uh, te technology fails at some point but yeah we we have our guests come in on zoom we we talk typically for we try to keep it around an hour um just so it's easier to digest i mean most of our guests we could sit down and probably talk to for five or six hours and yeah. just enjoy you know enjoy the entire day just talking but we try to keep it down to an hour because we 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 figure most people's commutes between work, uh, our, our commutes between work are about an hour. So mm -hmm. that gives us something to listen to. And we figured that way, um, it gives your, your average podcast listener, um, uh, something to listen to as well. Okay. And who is the, uh, who does the editing? So we don't do any editing. Um, it is, uh, you'll hear on occasion, you'll hear kids laughing or yep. dishes being put in the sink and we right. don't, we just, <laughs> We, nice. we don't do any, we don't do any editing. Um, if you say something you don't want to say, um, it's in there. It's in there. So it's in there. Cool. Right. Right. On. And the last one here, who do you, who's the host who, who hosts your files on, on the podcast? As in who distributes the files? Yeah, exactly. Like, is it like a Lipsyn or Buzzsprout? Uh, we, we use the anchor app. Oh, use Anchor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah we which use is owned anchor. by Spotify. Yeah. That, yeah. that's a pretty cool story with the anchor because, um, I think, uh, well, and is it still free? It is. Anchor is still free. It's still free, which is a great, I mean, I think, I think Anchor wouldn't be around if it wasn't for Spotify buying them because Spotify has done some amazing stuff in the podcasting space. Um, and there's never been a free hosting podcast uh, company that's lasted, you know, but the cool thing is, is Anchor makes it easy for people, right, to get into it. Like anybody right now could probably start a podcast in literally a, probably a couple hours, right? I mean, if, if you have the will to do it, um, I'm not just telling you to do it because Anchor is free. I'm telling you, you should just do it. Yeah, 
Like if it's something you're interested in, you should, yeah. you should try to get into it. Totally. I agree. No, I agree. I think it is uh this is the shout out to anybody out there. It's uh I think it's, you know, no, no matter if you just want to, you know, have fun, you know, do whatever, not even think of it as a monetizing it or whatever, or selling anything. It's just, you know, having a chat, right? And that's all that, that's all we've been doing today, you know, having a chat and helping some people learn about GAR. Um, cool, man. Well, thanks for letting me go down. I always love, you know, when I have fellow podcasters, it always gives me a chance to, to dig in a little bit. Um, let, let's uh, let's take it out of here, here uh, in a bit with Back to the Flies and some okay. of the fly tying design. So you mentioned, so we talked about the fly for, so, and I mentioned the brushes. Are you using brushes at all? Because that's one of the fair flies, right? They have the 5D brushes. Is that something yeah, you use or, yeah. Yeah. So their 5D brushes, dude, are pretty slick. And I mean that in like a good way. They make, I mean, they make great heads. They make great bodies. Um, but uh, there, there's two new brushes coming out. Uh, one is officially out and then one will be released here soon. And I'm going to go ahead and talk about that because they, mm -hmm. the, you know, Chris has spoken about them already. Okay. We actually have five, uh, fly fur brushes out now, which are blended, uh, different colors. I've got a black and blue one sitting on my desk right now. And it's, uh, they are awesome. Like, uh, <laughs> You, I've been making poppers with it. I've been making uh, black and blue bait fish, which are people like, but there's not a black and blue bait fish. No, there's not, but it makes a heck of a profile in stained water. I mean, they're awesome. And then we're we're getting, uh, I'll, I'll circle back around to the 5D brushes yeah. here in a second, yeah. but we, we have a shorter fibered 5D brush that's coming out as well, which is going to be, if you grab a regular 5D brush, and then one of the short fibered brushes, you're going to be able to tie some absolutely insane game changers. Mm, uh, yep. um, without a doubt, they're, they're going to be sick. And you're going to have everything you need in them. You're going to have sparse pieces of flash. You're going to have different colorations. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I, I really think that's going to speed up the process for a lot of tires for their game changers specifically. Right. Because that is one of the struggles, right? With I mean, everybody loves you know, tying flies, sitting down, you know, taking time, but they take a long time, right? That's the thing you're doing, tying a game changer and actually to, you know, in all honesty, I haven't tied one of those yet, but just seeing it, right? I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. So you're saying with these brushes, you could just tie it in quite a bit faster than you could a normal one. I think it's going to lessen the learning curve in a lot of aspects for taper. Uh, you will never, I mean, Blaine Chocolate, I mean, he's, he's a wizard. Yeah. And there's a lot of like really awesome dudes that have taken that platform and they ran with it. Like, you know, you got Schultzy and all these guys, they're yeah. time, like amazing, amazing changers. But, uh, I think, you know, at an entry level, this would be very easy to swallow and put material on a hook and start getting that understanding of, okay, so this is how it works. But in, until you really sit down and you tie, you know, X amount of those flies and do your homework, um, it's, it's never going to be an amazing fly, but it's going to be enough to help start building uh, that knowledge. You know, it's like yeah. the fundamentals of learning. You, you, you have rote application. Uh, it's RUAC. So it's, it's, you know, it's like rote understanding application correlation. So it, it's just building that process. Like your rote knowledge is that, oh, hey, uh, this, this is a game changer fly. And I know that because I've been told it was a game changer fly. So it's just, it's memorized there. And then, you know, the understanding is, okay, so I make these tapered wraps with these materials and the application is doing it. And then the right. correlation step is what's going to come from tying X amount of flies with uh, maybe some mentorship, mm -hmm. but it's, it, it gets you there faster faster that's the whole thing yeah. so and and when you have these like the the 5d brushes say you're tying like one of these flies for gar you're saying you were it's, it's got a long four inch profile like a you know it, can you just how does that work describe that a little bit on how you wrap it are you just tying it on or how, how does that when you have a, a brush so they're wire they're wire cord brushes so if you want to tie a gar fly i will we'll just talk through this real quick yeah let's do that All right, so pop the waddington shank in your vice and put a good thread base down. I use 100 or 150 GSP. And uh, get your good thread base down. Strip out the core of your uh, 
your rope. So there's an outside shell and there's an inside core. Oh yeah. The yeah. core, the core is what you're tying with. Gotcha. So take that outside sleeve off, um, and then pull each of those individual fibers. And you know, maybe I'll make a little video on this to show how I do this. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, if you could do that, and then maybe yeah. we can get that ready and throw it in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, I will. I will happily. Uh, I'll, I'll do that for you, so people can kind of understand nice. what I'm talking about. So, and then on your your rear station, you know, keep it kind of sparse. Tie in maybe three three of those strands doubled over, so a fifty fifty tie. So by fifty fifty, I mean your thread will secure that material at the halfway mark of that material, and then it'll be folded back on itself. Oh yeah, and then bullet tied. And then that's your rear section. And then add some flash. And some really great colors of flash are red, chartreuse, rainbow, silver, and gold. Those are absolutely amazing colors. And then just kind of sparse flash. And then to start adding a little bit of that, that flowing motion, um, that's where I'll tie my brush in. So I'll tie that section of wire in. And then all my stations get secured with uh, Loctite or Zappa Gap or Liquid Fusion because I don't want those teeth penetrating those fibers. The, the last thing I want is to break a fish off on a leader or break a fish off because it pulled out a material. Mm, yeah. So um, I try to make them bulletproof. And so uh, lots of glue. <laughs> so mm. I start I, uh, after I get that tied in, uh, it's uh, three securing wraps and then a whip finish and then uh, glue. And then I will make two wraps with one of these uh, fly fur brushes uh, or a uh, the 5D brush, I do one wrap because there's a lot more material on that. I'll do one full wrap and I'll come back around and I'll secure it again with three more wraps of thread or whatever it takes to cover that section. Sometimes it's a little bit more and then more glue and then more rope. And then since as, as we work towards the head, we want it to push water so uh, that means your materials have to get more dense. And that doesn't mean heavier per se. That just means a uh, larger uh, quantity of it. So that doesn't mean like, oh, I have to, I have to add like 16 wraps of this. No, I just, just add one more wrap. So uh, then it'll be instead of that three pieces of rope, it'll be six. And then these will be 70, 30 tied. So it'll be 70 out the back, 30 towards the front, pulled back, and then bullet tied, but not to exceed the length of your tailing material. So um, you want it all to blend and bleed together to make one solid profile. You don't want it. You don't want the front of your fly to be longer than the back. That's that's not going to do you any good. But you just okay. continue that process all the way up, and um, you know, take it to the head and it'd be three stacks of rope with okay. either one or two stacks of the brush in there. I gotcha. Um, so, and you just, yeah. yeah, you just incrementally increase the amount. So uh, rope would be three, five or six, and then another five or six. And then the brush, if it were 5d would be one and then it would be two wraps. So yeah, this is um, definitely, yeah, we're going to need a video for sure. Is there yeah. right now we'll get your video for sure. Uh, is there anybody doing like what kind of similar to what you described like on out there on Instagram or YouTube? Uh, I've got some live tying sessions where I've tied guard, uh, guard flies on my uh, Instagram. I think still oh, you do. Okay. Um, I'll, try to, I'll try to track some of that down. And but I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll just, I'll make a guard fly tutorial today as a reel. Oh, good. And, um, okay. All right, we'll put a we'll put a show note right now. This is we're talking in the past, in the future, whatever you know. Yeah. But uh, when this goes out, we'll have it in the show notes, and I'll put that right at the top, uh, so people can check that out and watch along. Um, nice. Well, thanks for doing that. It's definitely yeah. There's a few details, but um, and then on the just to wrap up the Fairfly stuff. So that's their focus. I mean, the five D, the the fly for. Are there other things they have going and and that you use in the fly tank, or the, is that the main stuff? Uh, so for myself, I, I kind of found that brand loyalty to a lot of tools very early on. Um, but they do sell tying tools. Uh, yeah. they have the, the, the Wasatch, the Wasatch stuff. And, um, they have those tools. They've got the, the fly fur, they've got the five D brushes and, uh, a few other things, but primarily, I mean, the, the, the big deal is honestly, it's going to be your brushes from Fairflies. That's, 
that that's the stuff that's you, what they're known for yeah that's what they're known for yeah that's right nice nice Right on. Well, I think that's uh, you know you know like we said, we're leaving some uh, stuff on the table, but we'll we'll get some resources and uh, kind of in the show notes for that. Um, and uh, yeah, are you? Uh, I was just gonna g- had a couple of random ones here as we get away. Maybe the, yeah, maybe maybe you can leave us with a couple of. Um, well, let's, let's before we get the the one random one or uh, here, but uh, give us the a couple of uh, back to the fishing, a couple of tips. So you're on the water, somebody's looking for a gar. You mentioned some already. Anything else? A tip or two you want to give us as we head out of here on, on yeah your, yeah dude yeah. so if you made it this far listening to me ran about stuff this is actually so important i should have said this earlier maybe maybe this will be the the little reel for instagram yeah. for this people will be it. let's hear it <laughs> once a guard takes the fly it is not a strip set if it is a, if it's anything but an alligator guard it's not a strip set they'll take the fly and you need to let them take the fly like they're gonna move with it and you need to count to five or six, maybe seven, depending on how excited you are. And then you need in, in that seven count, you know, seven, uh, like five Mississippi, right? Yep. So one Mississippi all the way up to five in that five count, you need to pull all of that slack up that's at your feet or in your stripping basket. And that needs to get up on your reel. Uh-oh. And the quickest way to do that is to slap the top of your reel. Uh, don't use your little handle. Don't use your little handle. Just roll the top of your reel and it'll catch that line up so much faster and then apply side pressure on that fish. It's, it's, it's not an actual strip set, um, because they're, they're doing the work and you'll feel it. And the reason you give them that, that five or six count is as they turn that fly in their mouth, you know, we talked about the tongs with teeth and they snap to the side. Well, that's the two pieces. This is the last piece of that equation. They are turning that fly in their mouth so that they can swallow it. Their mouths are so narrow, uh, oh, you know, right. their, their, their jaws are long. They got to swallow it head on. They have to swallow it head on. So how do you do that? You, you rotate it in your mouth. So as they're rotating it, that's what's getting those fibers caught in their teeth. That's cool. That was really cool. So five count, that's the key. And then, and then on the reel, I guess it depends. Like some reels are harder to spin. You're just saying like you spin it so that you have a kind of a nice free spinning reel. I do. Um, I don't know if I need to say brands or anything on here, yeah, but I use. Want, yeah, give a shout out. So um, my tin weight is it's a Max and Falcon. Oh yeah, uh, it's a Max and Falcon, and my reel is a uh, Max and Max reel. And um, I will honestly say I've, I've fished a lot of a lot of rods and reels up to this point, but that Max reel is the lightest 10 weight reel that I've ever held and had the ability to fish with. And that's, that's not a joke that, that, (laughs) yeah, that's cool. That 10 weight reel weighs as much as some of my five or six weight reels, um, with some of my other setups. That's great. Oh yeah. I'll give a, yeah, definitely Max. I ran into those guys at uh, one of the shows, uh, this last winter and, and chatted with them. I can't remember a couple guys were there, so I'll definitely give them a shout out. That's, that's cool. Cause they got some stuff going on. Are they re- reels, they have boats, I think, and a bunch of other things going. Yeah. They've got, they've got inflatables and they've, they've got a lot of cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Nice. All right. So that's it. So you want a reel that you can just, you know, slap and spin it up really quick to catch it, instead of like having a reel, because that's going to happen. Five seconds is going to happen quick. And then once once that five seconds is up, you, you're saying you just kind of, you're not really pull, are you kind of pulling with your rod or what, what's that set look like? So that set is going to look, whichever direction they're taking your line to, you apply a sweep to the left or right, but it doesn't have to be a hard sweep because they, you, you've got them hooked already. So it just needs to be a sweep to where you can get to the reel and start fighting the fish. So... Uh, instead of that, that's when you kind of get to choose to command that fight with that fish. Okay. Perfect. Nice. Well, um, I think we'll, we'll kind of send everybody into, uh, the show notes for other kind of resources and links here. Um, and, and I love that we, we dug into Gar because that was one that's been, you know, we haven't touched on, uh, in a while. Uh, so let, let's take it out of here with the, um, I, I, we, this is, this is going to be a funny uh, cat story because we've got a couple of cats. We're thinking about getting a second cat as well, but talk about what you have going because you've got this cat, um, uh, what is it like a boarding, a boarding school sort of thing? What, what do you got going with cats there? Yeah, uh, dude, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> like we've got, <laughs> we only take on one at a time, but we, we foster these cats, right? So 
um, they come in and like my, my wife, she will like find these cats, like, like just a stray cat on the street. Yeah. Like the stray cat on the street and then like take them to the vet. And then once they get healthy and all that stuff, I mean, they're staying with us during this time once they get healthy and then we find them a home. Wow. And you're spending probably some of the vet, right? You're depending on what's going on with the cat. You're spending a little bit of money there to get this. Yeah. We, we, we typically spend that money. Yeah. 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 That's, that's really cool. That's, I think that says a lot about your wife. You know what I mean? That's, that's not a, especially like the one you have. So describe this one. That's this mischievous one right now. What, what's it, what's it doing? Dude, it's this jet black cat. And it was like, it was pretty sick when we got it. And it's this little, little dude. And he's just, you know, he's chilling most of the time. He's super cute, super sweet, but he's a kitten. And our other cats are like old as, old as hell, dude. Like mm. <laughs> they're, they're super old and they're, they're out of shape and they just want to like lay around and dude, when they like stretch their legs and scratch stuff, yeah. like they lay on the ground to do it. Like they don't even like stand up to stretch anymore. <laughs> and, but this cat is like running around and like jumping on their backs and like bear oh. hugging them and like, Oh man. And like sliding in under them and like, uh, slapping their face and then running out. So he's just nice. been raised. He's been raising hell for like, for like a yeah. month now and it's it's yeah. been pretty funny but it gets pretty loud too <laughs> yeah how do you how do you know when he's ready uh when this cat you know when they're ready to go to sell or not sell just get, find a home for him well once they uh we make sure they know how to use a litter box which most cats do like pretty early on you know mm-hmm. like cat, cats are pretty smart yeah and um we make sure that uh we try i have a son so we we check temperament we we try to do as much like handling of them that we can safely do you know to get them used to people you know some some of these cats aren't just you know like off the street some of them are like from like just like a bad home you know like someone has like a cat farm like someone had like 20 cats but they never fed them and you know et cetera et cetera so now that cat guards their food you know so uh, that means while that cat's eating, you, you can't get near it while it's eating because it's in defense mode because it's had to fight for that food for so long. So we, we try to help the temperaments of the, of the animal. So it's suitable for most households. Like we, do, it's, it's hard to, to find a home for an animal that's like bad with kids or uh, can't use the litter box or scratches for six hours at night. So right. We, we try to work with these, these little, little fur balls to get them to be good, good for whatever nice. family needs them. So love that. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. We, like I said, we got a, a cat. We're looking at maybe getting a second one. You know, we lost our dog last year and yeah, cats are, you know, I hadn't had a cat since I was a little kid and they're, they're pretty cool animals because they don't take a lot of work and, uh, and they just do their thing, right? And they're still kind of, they're st- they're mostly friendly. They occasionally will scratch you, but uh, cool, man. Well, thanks thanks for going down the cat trail with yeah, me here. Dude. Um, well, this is this is I think been a great one. Um, I'll send everybody out to uh, at Morris Flyco if they want to check in with you, maybe pick your brain on Gar or get some flies. And um, yeah, man. Until we uh, you know meet again, uh, thanks again for all your uh, time today. Yeah, Dave. No, dude. Thank you so much for having me, and it's been a blast, man. Sweet. All right, John. Talk to you later. All right. Take care, dude. So there it is. Wetflyswing.com slash 361. 361. You know where to get uh, all the show notes, all the links, everything we talked about today. You get a little summary there. Check it out right now. Listener shout out before we get out of here. I'm going to, uh, I might not do a good job with this one, but Phil Jer, Jerzuski. There it is. Here we go. Listener shout out. We're going to get out of here real quick, but let's get a listener shout out here and Phil uh, Jerzuski, Jer- Jerzuski, I, I think I got that one right, Phil, hopefully. Uh, Phil hails out of Chicago, the Chicago area, and he loves steelhead fishing. He loves the steelhead episodes we've had on, like the Feenstra, Kevin Feenstra episode way back in the day. And he also noted the Tommy Lynch episode he loves. So thanks, Phil, for your support of this podcast. Uh, virtual fist bump right now, and uh, appreciate everything you're doing for for this show, helping to get the word out there. Would love to hear from you if you are wanting to get a show topic, want to give some feedback on the show, want to connect with me. I'd love to hear from you, Dave at wetflyswing.com. That's the easiest way. I check all those emails and would love to give you a shout out if you want one here. 
and uh, and that's what we got. That's how we roll here. We got this going. We are getting ready to roll onto another big episode, and uh, I'm going to get onto that right now. I'm going to get some of that intro outro stuff done, and and get that over. That's the way the the sausage is made here. Um, I do these intros, outros, and then I send them over to Dom, who puts everything together, gets it cleaned up, gets it edited, and then uh, and then we have a final product that's ready to go, just like you're hearing now. So you don't you know hear all the background and everything we're doing, but it is it is some pretty good work. So I appreciate uh, again appreciate you for checking in today, and I hope uh, you I hope you I hope you I hope to catch you on the river maybe on the water or maybe online and i hope you are having a good afternoon good evening or good morning wherever you are in the world and i will talk to you soon thanks for listening to the wet fly swing fly fishing show for notes and links from this episode visit wetflyswing.com